Lord, anoint our time together today. May we see Jesus, is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Since childhood, I have been had a personal fascination with mountains. Uh, I was born near the mountains. As a young child, our family frequently took hikes in the mountains of Washington State. At the age of 10, we moved from eastern Washington to the state of Colorado. And of course, then we had the great Rocky Mountains. In 1970, our family moved again, this time to the heart of northeastern Oregon and the Wallowa Mountains. Now, if you know anything about the Wallowa Mountains, uh, you've got to love them. Uh, they've often been referred to as the little Swiss Alps of America. Now, living there, I became even more fascinated with mountains. Uh, but then in 1971, our family moved again, this time to the Midwest and suburban Chicago, Illinois. And if you've ever been to Chicago, there are no mountains there. I had never been that far east in my life. Um, it was indeed a rude awakening for me. Um, the mountains were replaced with skyscrapers. I remember going with my eighth grade class from what earth could they possibly snow ski in the state of Illinois? I mean, there's a lot of skyscrapers and there's a lot of cornfields just snow skiing but i must tell you having learned to ski in the great rocky mountains what a joke um that day i discovered the origin of the stick to make molehill the ski area could ski from the top of this hill down into this hole that they created and they called that snow skiing now, maybe I'm exaggerating just a little bit, but mind you, it was no mountain. When I was 17, our family moved back to the state of Colorado, and there I took frequent backpacking trips into the Rocky Mountains. I had the opportunity to, to climb many of the mountains, including some of the 14,000-foot peaks in the state of, Cal of, uh, of uh, Colorado mountains. I love them. And I thank God every day that I'm not living in Nebraska. Sorry, Cornhuskers. Last week in my introduction to this sermon series, I said that we'd be exploring the significant mountains of scripture and discover lessons God had for his people there and then, and subsequently the lessons that he has from the mountains in scripture for us today. And so as we climb these mountains of the Bible, uh, you won't need crampons, rope, you won't need an ice axe or an oxygen mask. Our climb won't be technical. It will be practical as we journey atop some of the majestic peaks of the Bible. Together we'll climb such peaks as Mount Ararat as we do today. Mount Moriah, Mount Sinai, Mount Carmel, Mount Olivet, Mount Calvary, Mount Zion, and more. Some of the greatest events in biblical history have transpired on the top of a mountain. Somebody in these mountains will prepare us for a deeper relationship with Jesus as we live in the last days of earth's history. Today, I invite you to open your Bible with me to the sixth chapter of the book of Genesis. And we're going to take a look at this study here. Um, this is chapter six. And uh, as we climb uh, Mount Ararat, I'm going to read here Genesis chapter 6, verses 1 through 8. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for, it, it, for he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came 
to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were old, men of that the wickedness of man was great in, in the earth, and that every intent of the thought of his heart was only evil continually. And the Lord uh, was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing that I have made them. But Noah found grace, Lord. That is the beginning salvo of the climb to Mount Ararat. As you all know from your understanding and your scripture and having heard this story of the account of the flood over and over, God finally came to a place where he says, man, this is just too much. The world has become so corrupt that I have no other choice but to destroy them. And so God uh, brought about the destruction of uh, the world. But God never, ever brings destruction without bringing warning. And so the warning message went out through Noah. For 120 years, he preached. He invited people to get on board the ark. They thought he was a lunatic, a crazy Oh, man, it's never rained. And then at the end of that 120 years, one day the animals began to board the ark. And seven days later, and, and then the ark of uh, the door of the ark closed by an unseen hand, and seven days later it started to rain. And there weren't people who were laughing then. I recently uh, was shared a cartoon that uh, is humorous and yet pathetic. Uh, picture it, if you will. Obviously, I can't present with you to you any graphics today, but picture this in your mind. You can see the ark. It's pouring down rain. You can see the tops of mountains, just a few tops of mountains peaking. Too many people took that attitude, with the exception of the animals that boarded the ark and the eight members of Noah's family, including himself. Listen to this quotation taken from the book Patriarchs and Prophets, page 92. After the fall, men chose to follow their own sinful desires, and as the result, crime and wretchedness rapidly increased. Neither the marriage relationship nor the rights of property were respected. Whoever coveted the wives or the possessions of his neighbor took them by force, and men exulted in their deeds of violence. The earth had become so violent, friends, that God had to destroy it. Now, as difficult as, as, as it is to believe, according to the Bible, the antediluvian world was even more crazy and more wicked than it is today. Now, for some of us, that's pretty hard to believe when you consider all the craziness and the violence going on in the world. You say, seriously? Really? But I can't help but believe that we're getting close to that period of time. Someone once said that if the world gets any worse, God is going to have to apologize to the antediluvians. Let's notice what happened to the flood, uh, or rather to the ark after the flood. Uh, would you notice what it says in uh, Genesis chapter 8 and verse 4? Genesis 8 and verse 4. It says, Then the ark rested of Ararat. The ark came to rest on the mountains of Ararat. Now, Ararat was a mountainous region in the area that is now known as Eastern Turkey. It was to that region that Noah's ark came to rest. The highest of the mountain peaks there in these mountains of Ararat, which is halfway between the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, um, is nearly 17,000 feet in elevation, and it's known as Mount Ararat. Now, there have been numerous attempts to pinpoint uh, the location and the relics uh, of, of Noah's Ark. Uh, in recent years, modern satellite technology has been employed. Um, it's not my intent today to deal with the archaeology of Noah's Ark. If you want to do that, just Google Noah's Ark on the Internet and plan to spend a boatload of time looking up the results. Despite claims, no one has conclusively found the remains of Noah's Ark. Since we don't know exactly where the Ark landed, and, and, and since Mount Ararat is today, that's the mountain we'll climb. We know what happened on Mount Ararat. 
The question is, what can we learn from the top of Mount Ararat? There are two major points I'd like to focus on today. First of all, Mount Ararat calls us to explore the authenticity of the flood itself. Though it may seem strange for some uh, of you to believe, the historicity of the flood is increasingly being called into question. Even in certain religious circles, sadly folks, even in some Adventist circles. Now there's no doubt that the flood has been an event questioned by the scientific community. But it's quite a different story when pastors, theologians, and so-called biblical scholars call the event into question. Never was this more clearly brought to my attention than several years ago when I had the occasion to visit with another pastor about this issue, a pastoral colleague of my own faith. This particular pastor was involved in a significant teaching position in one of our Adventist institutions. The two of us had a one-on-one -on -one discussion regarding the flood. I asked him several questions that went something like this. Here's my question. Do you believe in the flood of the book of Genesis? To which he responded, what do you mean by flood? I said, I mean a global catastrophe, a worldwide cataclysmic event. Well, are you asking me that question biblically or scientifically? I responded, explain. I don't believe the scientific evidence is there, he said, to support a global flood. I believe the flood was a localized event only in Noah's part of the world. I must tell you that I was absolutely blown away by this discussion that I had. The idea held by most scientists is that the geological columns of the Earth support the evolutionary, uh, uh, the evolution of a lesser form of life at the lowest strata, progressing to a more complex form of life at the upper strata. But if that's the case, you could use the same argument to support the biblical account of the flood. Follow me. The flood waters would have covered the lesser forms of life first while the more in intellectual and intelligent and thus been encased in the upper strata. In recent years, there's a geological study uh, which seems to support the veracity of a global flood. A geologist analyzed the wave action of the various geological strata around the world. What he discovered is that over, that, that, that on every level of strata around the world, the genesis See substantial conclusion. Listen to what Je uh, I'm sorry, what Genesis chapter eight and verse one says. Then God remembered Noah and everything li uh, living, and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. While my first point has to do with the authenticity of the flood itself. My second point has to do with the authenticity of the scriptural account of the flood. There are those in circles of higher learning that would assert that the biblical account of the localized event, just as my ministerial colleague asserted. A few years ago, another Adventist pastor friend of mine was pursuing a theological doctoral degree from an esteemed public university in the Midwest of the United States. His professor, who was steeped in what is known as higher criticism, constantly bashed and berated the authenticity of the scriptural stories. These stories are nothing but folklore, the professor would tell the class. Anyone who believes this stuff is obviously deluded. The professor gave the class an assignment to carefully exegete from the Hebrew this passage of Genesis chapter 6. My friend that I have known since childhood, made a tactical error when he raised his hand and asked the professor this question in class. Professor, if these stories are, as you say, fables and fairy tales, then why is there a need for us to be so careful to exegete the passage? No sooner than these words left his mouth, he knew he was in serious trouble. The professor was caught in his own foolishness and immediately went into a tirade. He dismissed my friend from class, then proceeded to flunk him for the semester. 
since the class was a core component of office on his hands and knees to organize to complete rest by independent study. Brings to mind the statement by Ellen White in the book Book 3, page 306. She says, there are men who think they have wonderful discoveries in science. The scientific research in which these men have indulged has uh, provided a snare to them. It has clouded their minds and they have drifted into skepticism. They have a consciousness of power and instead of looking to the source of all wisdom, they triumph in the smattering of knowledge they may have gained. They are exalted, um, they have exalted their human wisdom in opposition to the wisdom of the great and mighty God and have dared to enter into controversy with him. The word of inspiration pronounces these men fools. Wow. If the flood story is a fable, then in my estimation, it raises some serious questions regarding the character of God. How many of you have ever seen a rainbow? I think we've all seen a rainbow, haven't we? Um, let's take a look at um, Genesis chapter 9, and uh, beginning with verse 8. We want to read what the Bible ha here has to say about rainbows. Genesis chapter 9, beginning with verse 8, it says, Then God spoke to Noah and to his sons with him, saying, And as for me, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after and with every living earth. Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again, never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant which is between me and you and every creature of all the earth. The waters shall never again become a flood to destroy all flesh. The rainbow shall be in the cloud and I will look on it to remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is on the earth. So here's the here's the uh, the issue, folks. If the flood was a localized event, or if the Genesis account of the flood is a fable or a myth, then a rainbow. Every time I see a rainbow, it reminds me that God is a liar. Think about that. The rainbow. If all of this stuff is fairy tale and fable then it reminds me that God is a liar. What I believe about the flood story has serious implications. Follow me. What's the basic issue of the great controversy? The ba basic issue is the integrity and justice of God. If God had to resort to telling me anything less than the truth in Genesis chapter 6 through 9, then Lucifer's accusations against God are true. Every single one of them. God is not just. God is a liar. And he's not fair. But it doesn't stop in the book of Genesis, folks. Let's notice the words of Christ in Matthew chapter 24. You, you all know them. I'm going to read them here for you. Matthew 24, 36 to 39. Jesus was preaching one day, and this is what he's told the crowd. He says, but of that day and hour, he's telling this to, to the crowd and to his disciples regarding the second co his second coming. They were asking him when he was going to come again. But of that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, but my Father only. But as the days of Noah were, so also will be the... I may not have all the answers. Call me a fundamentalist, if you will, but I still believe, my friends, in the veracity of God's word. Amen? Amen? This whole issue of the Genesis flood is about the great controversy between Christ and Satan. The devil has attempted to call into question this story from the initial pages of Scripture. Why? Because the real truth about the flood is not about those who were lost, but about those who were saved. Water. Now more than ever, we are riding on the flood of the deception that the devil is sending our way. 
But remember, my friends, the flood story is about a loving Savior. As you consider Mount Ararat, is do you believe that Savior? Do you believe his word? The destruction of the world is soon to be repeated. Jesus is soon to come. The devil doesn't want us to believe in the final destruction of the wicked any more than he wants us to believe in the Genesis flood. So as we climb Mount Ararat, who are we going to believe and follow? A fallen angel or a loving Lord? Today, I invite you to accept the mercy and the grace of Jesus, our Savior, and prepare for his soon return. My friends, the Savior is waiting. The Savior is waiting to enter your heart. Why don't you let him come in? There's nothing in this world to keep you apart. What is your answer to him? this story, this experience from the top of Mount Ararat. We understand that uh, it's more than just a story about a bunch of animals getting on a, a boat. It's more than just eight people getting in the ark. It's more than just rain falling for 40 days and 40 nights. It's more than just animals and people cooped up for more than a year before they were able to exit. It's a story that deals significantly with the veracity of Scripture and with your character and reputation. So as we contemplate this message today, this story, this lesson from the top of Mount Ararat, may we be ever more ready to accept you as a loving Savior and not listen to the enemy's attempts to discredit your character and defame your reputation. We invite you, Lord, to come into our hearts. We know that you are waiting for us, and we accept your invitation and want you to come into our hearts today. Now, Lord, grant us that peace that passes all understanding until we can see you face to face and spend the ceaseless ages of eternity with you, never to know the trials and troubles of life on this planet again. Keep us until that day we ask and pray in Christ's name. Amen. <laughs>